Welcome back. Let's discuss how to interpret a thyroid lab panel. This really matters. Let me give you one data point as to why. Journal Thyroid Meta-Analysis found that 37.1% of individuals did not need the thyroid medication that they were on. How do I mean that? Well, they were able to stop taking the medication. They maintained normal thyroid levels all on their own, unmedicated, and their symptoms stayed exactly the same. So why do we find ourselves here? Well, it's because the interpretation of the lab results, in some cases, is getting sloppy, theoretical, however we want to describe it, being done, in my opinion, with good intentions. But I don't think you are getting scientific guidelines for interpreting your lab panels. And there are areas in which we don't have adequate science to answer a question with full scientific confidence, if you will. However, this is an area where there's good science that can give us assurances of, are we hypothyroid? Are we sluggish thyroid? What's the difference between those two? And how do we get to the right treatment option for that? So with that, let's run through TSH, free T4, T3, thyroid antibodies, hypothyroid Hashimoto's, and just give you sort of the straight talk that's science-based to help you improve how you're feeling as quickly as possible. Welcome to Dr. Ruscio Radio, providing practical, science-based insights into health. We break through the bias and the noise to bring you simple, trustworthy information that matters. And to start, let's just briefly recap thyroid physiology. Thyroid located in your throat, butterfly-shaped gland that produces thyroid hormone. The thyroid hormone is important, as you've probably heard, because it regulates the metabolic rate of every cell in your body. So metabolic function, heart rate and respiration, hair, skin, and nails, gastrointestinal motility, brain function, all these things can be impacted. However, a really important caveat, just because you might be having symptoms with poor metabolic function, dry skin, thinning hair, slow motility or constipation or fuzzy thinking like brain fog doesn't mean the thyroid is causing those problems. So how do we know? We do a thyroid panel and we interpret it correctly. As we come to thyroid physiology and sort of how this system works, just a couple pieces to orient us. You have in the brain, your hypothalamus and your pituitary. This is analogous to the thermostat in your house. It senses the temperature or it senses the levels of thyroid hormone in circulation. Then you have the thyroid gland, which produces the hormone. So this would be your heater. Because we want to be careful that we can circulate the heat, we have insulation that moves or, or, or helps prevent the heat loss. And this is what I compare to T3. So thermostat function is hypothalamus and pituitary. Gland function, heater, is T4, free T4. And then the viability of the insulation of your home is T3 and reverse T3. The real feedback loop that we want to be concerned with is the viability of the thermostat, TSH, and the viability of the heater, the thyroid gland. And we'll go over what markers correlate with that, but just to sort of give us this orientation. By the way, if this has been helpful, please comment and subscribe. So coming to TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone, the thermostat. This is where, again, the hypothalamus detects and then the pituitary releases TSH. Important caveat, these ranges are mostly what you will see reported on the lab report. So it's important to use these reference ranges and be cautious of what your doctor writes in. Now, I'm not telling you to disregard what your doctor is saying. What I am trying to point to is in some realms of, of integrative and progressive healthcare, these theoretical ranges are being used, which are incorrect in my view. And this is part of the reason why that meta-analysis in the journal Thyroid found 37% of people were on hormone who did not need it. It's a result directly of the doctors using these, these narrow ranges that are supposed to be better, and quite frankly, they're not. But we'll make this case for you scientifically. So on the lab for TSH, next to your number, you should see a parenthetical value. 
0.45 to 4.5 is that range for TSH. For free T4, so assessment of the heater, how much hormone can be produced. Let me just make one or two remarks here in that 80% of what comes out of the thyroid gland is T4. There's a small amount produced as T3, but the vast majority, 80%, is free T4. This is a good thing. We, we need it to be inactive as T4 before it becomes activated as T3. Why? Well, we wouldn't want all the active hormone right here. You need to get it to your stomach, to your gonads, to your brain. So it has to be bound to a carrier protein so that it can sort of have a shuttle or a ride to the target site and then become activated into T3. The range for free T4 is 0.8 to 1.8. Some labs are using 1.7. Look at your lab, careful not to follow what your doctor has written in. And then there is free T3. And T3, again, is giving us a sense of the insulation. This is the active form. The range here is 2.1 to 4.4. Now, regarding insulation, it's important to bear in mind that stress, diet, too low calorie, too low carb, and inflammation can be akin to leaving a window open. So if you're trying to get your bedroom warm so you can sleep, let's say, and you have all the windows open and it's cold outside, you might be going, Grr, why, you know, why won't the room get warm? It may not be the heater's fault. The heater may be making plenty of heat, free T4, but the insulation may be poor in that you have all the windows open and you're not able to get enough heat in the room. The thing here to really clarify, again, is that this is not telling you the viability or the health of the thyroid gland. One thing, one marker that can give you an assessment into the health of the gland are thyroid antibodies. Now, the antibody here that should be used is TPO, thyroid peroxidase. This is elevated in Hashimoto's, which can cause hypothyroidism. The lab, and this is the one exception to where what the labs report don't necessarily give you the full story. Let me explain. The labs will have a cutoff. Anything above usually 35 for TPO is considered positive. If you are above 500, that is when someone appears to be at risk. So above 35, the lab will say this is positive, but there's data emerging looking to, to, to quantify, well, are all elevations the same or might this be something like blood sugar? Your fasting blood sugar shouldn't be above 99, but if someone's 103, that's not cause for concern. The same thing appears to apply here, wherein the labs will cut off 35, above 35 is considered positive. The value doesn't seem to pose risk until you're at or above 500. So let's detail that point firstly, the, the Hashimoto's and the antibody TPO or thyroid peroxidase. This is the best way to diagnose Hashimoto's in a predictive fashion for hypothyroidism. Confirming with ultrasound will increase the accuracy. Here are some numbers. Here is the data-driven case. The prevalence of people in the population who have positive TPO antibodies is 20%. So we go out, we screen people, 20% will have positive TPO antibodies. However, only 5% of the population is hypothyroid. And I don't say that as only. For those 5%, let's make sure we do everything we can to improve your quality of life, reduce your symptoms. Yes, 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 right? However, we need to understand the stats so we understand risk. So 20% TPO positive, 5% hypothyroid. And this is from the Journal of the Endocrine Society and a huge credit and thank you to former American Thyroid Association president, Dr. Antonio Bianco, who is on the podcast where we drill down into some of these prevalence numbers because this is really important. Simple math, 20% of people have DPO, 5% are hypothyroid. What does that tell you? It tells you that 75% of individuals with Hashimoto's will not become hypothyroid. So the good news is that Hashimoto's does not guarantee hypothyroid. In fact, the risk is 25%. Now, there are things we can do to protect against that, but it's really important to take a step back and discuss the prevalence data, which is 
75% of people with Hashimoto's will not become hypothyroid. You may have heard of another marker for assessing autoimmunity, TG, or thyroglobulin. This, in and of itself, is not diagnostic. But when fact-checking the validity of these different markers, you find data as follows, quoting a 2019 review paper, in the absence of TPO antibodies, thyroglobulin, or TG, antibodies are not significantly associated with thyroid disease. So it's really important to bear this in mind that TPO is accurate. Ultrasound accurate TG or thyroglobulin does not appear to be an accurate marker. One other point on antibodies I wanted to make is that antibodies alone don't cause symptoms. Now I know this is counter to what some are saying. And again, for me, I care most about giving you accurate information so you can improve your health and reduce your symptoms. It's important that we do this because if we don't, we can inculcate people into thinking their symptoms are coming from somewhere they're not. And this is where using science, when we have quality investigation, is really helpful. So let me quote a 2022 review paper, which is part of where I've taken this position from. The presence of symptoms in Hashimoto's is linked to its evolution into hypothyroidism. Signs and symptoms of hypothyroidism are a consequence of thyroid hormone deficiency. And that is a key point. Coming back to the fact that 75% of people who have Hashimoto's won't develop hypothyroid, this tells us, this, this partially hints at the same quote, which is if you have Hashimoto's alone, that doesn't drive symptoms and it's not a problem for most people, 75%. Now, again, I want to keep being careful not to say I'm diminishing that 25%. And there are things that we can do to improve quality of life, reduce symptoms. Absolutely. I just want to be careful that people are not trying to treat what is not causing their symptoms. And that would be the antibodies in them themselves. They're a preventative measure. Let's come back to the risk piece in terms of how much risk are you at if you have elevations of TPO. TPO above 35 is positive, but risk of progression to hypothyroid is not seen unless you're above 500. This comes predominantly from a 2016 study that tracked over 300 Hashimoto's patients who had normal levels of thyroid hormone but had Hashimoto's for six years. And here's what they found, quoting, Hashimoto's patients with TPO antibody levels below 500 had no increased risk for developing hypothyroidism. I'm hoping all this is empowering and helping you to understand that not all levels of TPO antibodies pose the same risk. Okay, so how do we define hypothyroidism, true hypothyroidism, when the heater is under-functioning, so to speak? This is when you will see a combination, so together, high TSH, according to the lab values, and low free T4. Remember, this is 5% of the population, and these people do require medication and will benefit from medication. Now, conversely, the opposite end of the spectrum is an overfunctioning heater, a heater that won't turn off. And this is low TSH paired with high free T4. This is hyperthyroidism, 1% of the population, and they require a different medication usually. Methimazole is the drug of choice here that reduces thyroid function. And then the area that is the most pernicious in my view is sluggish thyroid, the, the gray area. This is where we have high TSH paired with normal free T4. This is known as sluggish. In medical terminology, it's known as subclinical hypothyroidism. Remember the cutoff for TSH is abnormality over 4.5, up to about seven. This is 3 to 15% of the population, and there's debate over what is best in terms of how we treat these individuals. But I want to share with you some data. A 2021 observational study looking at 225 patients with sluggish thyroid. They were monitored. After six months, 74% returned to normal thyroid function. This is part of the reason why I'm trying to give you a cautious perspective on this because part of what contributes to that 37% of people 
on medication who don't need it that we discussed earlier is people who have sluggish thyroid and they're not monitored, but rather they're put on thyroid hormone prematurely. So good news here, optimistic news in that 74% of people seem to go from sluggish thyroid to normal if they do nothing else. Now we'll give you a few supplemental strategies you can use to help increase the likelihood that you maintain or you return to normal. But let me go through one more data point that was trying to answer the question, maybe people with sluggish thyroid will see improvements in brain function, quality of life, energy, if we give them thyroid hormone. In fact, this question is one that conventional medicine appears to care a lot about because there are 21 randomized control trials summarized in the Journal of the American Medical Association, summarizing over 2,000 people's experience who had sluggish thyroid and were given thyroid hormone medication. And I'll just quote, the use of thyroid hormone therapy was not associated with improvements in general quality of life or thyroid related symptoms. These findings do not support the routine use of thyroid hormone therapy in adults with subclinical or sluggish hypothyroidism. And again, this is why we want to keep in mind the fact that that other paper found 37% of people were on thyroid hormone and they could stop and their symptoms didn't change. It's because sluggish thyroid is being overtreated. Now, that all being said, if you have symptoms, this tells us the symptoms are, pro uh, are probably coming from somewhere other than your thyroid. I want to make sure that we cover a caveat. The sluggish thyroid is when the TSH gets up to about seven. When you go above seven, this is where people seem to benefit. Quoting a 2022 review paper from the Journal of Internal Medicine. Generally, treatment is not necessary unless TSH exceeds seven to 10. In double-blinded, Randomized control trials, treatment does not improve symptoms or cognitive function if the TSH is less than 10. So this is why I'm urging caution in that we don't treat sluggish thyroid too early because 74% will go back to normal with time and no other intervention. And because unless your TSH levels are above somewhere between 7 and 10, you will not see improvements in your symptoms. Now, if you're someone who is having fatigue or dry skin or brain fog. I hear you. And you know, actually I'm, I'm quite interested in this. And this is why myself and the people at our clinic have published two scientific papers on this to date in terms of, well, what can we do to improve the symptoms of these people? And there are two things that really seem to be overlooked, maybe three, someone's digestive health, someone's nutrient status, and someone's diet. And without going too far into solutions, I just want to recognize and acknowledge that if you're having symptoms, there are solutions. So what are the recommendations in short then for those who are in the gray area, for those who have this sluggish thyroid? You can retest and monitor every three to six months and see does your TSH ever consistently exceed seven to 10. Look at your TPO levels. Are they over 500? Then this would mean you have increased risk for becoming hypothyroid. Consider your family history. Is there a strong family history? This is one thing that seems really left out of the equation when we're screening someone for the viability of the diagnosis of hypothyroid to see if they're in that 37% of people who don't actually need the hormone. We'll look at really basic things. Are you the only person in your family with hypothyroid? Hmm, that's odd. Who diagnosed you? An anti-aging clinic. Hmm, they're a little bit quick to give hormones, right? So these things are not too hard to get a sense for when you look at the data objectively. And then you can use certain supplements to help support maintaining normal thyroid function. A 2013 randomized control trial gave people with sluggish thyroid selenium and myoinositol. And after six months, they found a decrease in TSH, a decrease in thyroid antibodies, and an improvements in the appearance of the thyroid gland on ultrasound. The typical protocols used here are 83 micrograms of selenium and 600 milligrams of myoinositol. So that's one option. Another option is vitamin D. Three separate meta-analyses have found that vitamin D can lower TPO antibodies. So another option. 
at a dose between 1,000 and 8,000 IUs per day for between three and six months. And often overlooked would be probiotics. This is from a 2017 randomized control trial that gave people who were on thyroid hormone probiotics. They found that those taking the probiotic required less medication over time and those in the control or the placebo group needed more medication over time. Now, why is this? Well, often overlooked, really important, and what we've published on, some symptoms come from the gut and they're blamed on thyroid. Brain fog, fatigue, poor nutrient absorption, therefore perhaps dry skin or, or thinning hair. But also remember that if you're taking something like levothyroxine or armor, that is contingent upon absorption. And if absorption isn't good because gut health is somewhat impaired, then you can be like the control group here who needed more medication over time because they don't have good absorption or the probiotic group needed less medication over time ostensibly because they were absorbing the medication better. So this is not an exhaustive list. I don't want to go too far afield into treatment options, but just to hit a few of the key points in terms of what you can do to be preventative and also restorative for thyroid hormone function or to restore normal symptoms. If you have low T3, a few comments, it could be that the low T3 is because of low T4. Because remember, T4 is converted into T3. So if you have low T4, then that could be the simple obvious cause of the low T3. However, if your T4 levels are normal and you have low T3, again, looking at the ranges on the labs and not what someone else is writing in, not the theoretical ranges, really important clarification, then it could be the problem with insulation. This is where a diet too low in calories or too low in carbs, high levels of stress or inflammation are all akin to leaving a window open. And here's one scenario I've called out before and I, I just wanna issue this caution again. If we have a skewed perspective on Hashimoto's, if we think Hashimoto's guarantees hypothyroid, so we don't understand the risk correctly. Additionally, if we have incorrect information regarding interpretation of the levels, so 40 is looked at as a high risk level, what this can lead to is people over treating Hashimoto's and saying, well, you've got to cut out all gluten, all dairy, better yet still cut out all grains completely and even go on the autoimmune paleo diet. And this can lead to, firstly, psychological stress. But secondly, this is where some people are made worse because that diet or those dietary recommendations can lead to too low calorie and too low carb. So in some cases, the simplest thing you can do to improve your health is have an accurate appreciation for the risk posed by Hashimoto's so that you don't overly restrict your diet. Now, certainly improving one's diet quality is important, but there is such a thing as going too far. Let me give you one other example. And big thank you and credit to Dr. Robert Abbott, who published this study. He's a colleague and a friend. They took people who were on a baseline paleo-like diet that was gluten-free. They put them on the AIP diet. So they went from baseline paleo-like gluten-free to then autoimmune paleo, much more restrictive. They found no improvements in thyroid autoimmunity. So what I would argue is that the people who are on the diet that's harder to adhere to may be more prone to exhibit symptoms of caloric or carbohydrate insufficiency. Now, full disclosure, the people in that group who went on the AIP diet, they saw improved symptoms. But part of the intervention was also counseling, stress management, and community support. So it's really hard to disentangle those two in terms of you're showing up, you're having attention, community, therapy, that's probably gonna go a long way in improving someone's symptoms. Overcorrecting with diet can actually make you feel worse. And I'm hoping that all these sort of data points are connecting and helping you to see how to navigate the, the accurate center ground here and not get too far in either extreme. Okay, so then summarizing all of this in this table, Hashimoto's, specifically TPO antibodies, detectable above 35, at risk above 500. Sluggish thyroid. TSH, anywhere from 4.5 up to 7, maybe 10, paired with normal free T4. At risk Hashimoto's and sluggish thyroid. TPO above 500, 
TSH above 4.5 up to 7 to 10, and normal free T4. Hypothyroid, antibodies don't matter because antibodies don't diagnose hypothyroid. TSH above 4.5, importantly, paired with low free T4. Quick caveat here, if your TSH is 5.5 and your free T4 is 0.5, your doctor astutely may say, let's retest because you're not very far from the range. Normally, when people have hypothyroid, there is a drastic elevation in the TSH, 20, 40, 50. There was one paper, and I may be slightly off my numbers here, but that found the average TSH at time of diagnosis was something like 50. So bear that in mind with the hypothyroid diagnosis. And then at-risk Hashimoto's with hypothyroid is TPO antibodies above 500, along with the TSH above 4.5 paired with low free T4 below 0.8. In recap, the thermostat is a pituitary and hypothalamus detecting heat or detecting levels of thyroid hormone. The heater is the thyroid gland T4, free T4, and the insulation is T3. Hashimoto's or autoimmunity is something to pay attention to, but the risk that poses is often not discussed correctly. Remember, 75% of those with Hashimoto's will maintain normal function. 25 will become hypothyroid. Regarding hypothyroid, we provided interpretation guidelines and to be cautious that your clinician has not been too quick to diagnose you hypothyroid and put you on medication because as we covered, 37% of people, according to the meta-analysis from the journal Thyroid, were able to stop their hormone, maintain normal thyroid levels all on their own, and had no change in symptoms. And then finally, regarding sluggish thyroid, the majority, 74%, will become normal with time. You can use certain supplements to increase the odds of maintaining normal thyroid function and Medication does not appear to help sluggish thyroid unless the TSH is above somewhere between 7 to 10. Hopefully that helps you. This is a combination of, of positions that are sometimes adopted by conventional medicine and sometimes adopted by alternative medicine. And what I've attempted to do for you is just give you what the science supports. We do have adequate science here, like I mentioned earlier, so we can be confident in these conclusions. And again, hopefully they help you reconcile the different things you hear from different camps. I think conventional medicine has some right here. Alternative medicine has some right here. And that's what I've attempted to distill down into these guidelines for you today. Alrighty, this is Dr. Ruscio, and I hope this helps. 